Yo, welcome to the stream. So this is Out of Battery Live, not so live today. I am your host, Cape. And with me today is a very special guest. Welcome to the show, Durbin. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? So what are we going to work on today, man? Marlin. Marlin 2. So for those of you that... Uh, I, I should have brought uh, some visual aids. I kind of forgot until like 10 seconds ago. But, uh, you know, uh, you might have seen printers that have some cool images that flash on the start screen when they're booting up. And, you know, how do people do that? Well, the answer is they have to tinker with their firmware. And... The first question you might ask is, what is firmware? So to start with, firmware is just any program that's interacting with a piece of hardware at a very low level way, right? And so for a printer, the firmware is the software running on the machine that's going to control the CNC operation, you know, feed things through the extruder, heat up the hot end. And we want to be able to control our printers, get information from all the sensors, and display some of the information either over serial or on the display. So Marlin is the firmware we're going to be looking at today. And a little bit of background on Marlin. Marlin is a... Uh, you know, rewinding time a bit that when 3d printers first became available to consumers, the, there was a project that still exists today called the rep wrap project, whose explicit goal was to make machines that could replicate themselves. Right. And from the rep wrap project, uh, you, you get a lot of the major, um, printer models that exist today and it was explicitly an open source project and the hardware and software for it was you know being kicked around in an open source fashion between people in the rep rap community and pretty early on some folks decided that they wanted to standardize firmware quite a bit more than existed at the time and they wanted to do it using easily available boards like Arduinos. And so the Marlin project was born. Since then, the Marlin project has developed a lot. So it's no longer just Arduinos and it's fully, fully featured firmware. So when you go to the store and you buy a 3D printer, the vast majority of printers are running Marlin explicitly or the manufacturer of the printer forked Marlin, took the, the base code, which is available because it's open source. They modified it, made their own version of it, and then used that instead. A side effect of that is almost all printers can run Marlin. And so uh, this is a big upside of Marlin. Uh, one thing, if you've been around the 3D printing community for a little while, you might have noticed is... The second you mention Marlin, it's like the Clipper guys have an alert or something because they come out of the woodwork suddenly to let you know that they made the switch to Clipper. And that's all well and good. I, To be fair to Clipper, I love Clipper. I have, have run Clipper on printers before. I really like Clipper. It is very, very good at what it does. However, there are considerations you need to make when deciding whether you're going to choose Marlin or choose Clipper, right? So Clipper, uh, much, much fancier controls than Marlin. Uh, the screens tend to support fancier things as well, but setting it up initially can be uh, quite a bit of legwork. And particularly if you are Clipperizing a printer where you don't, uh, no one has done the legwork for that board. There's going to be a lot of work in the same way that there is for Marlin, but more people have sort of built out 
configurations for printers with Marlin. And so if you don't have a Raspberry Pi, you have an unusual printer, or you just don't feel like learning uh, how to switch to Clipper, I think Marlin is a very, very good choice, and it is very good firmware. And so today we are going to loosely walk through all the steps you need to do if you're running Windows, Mac, or Linux in order to set up a machine to build your own Marlin configuration, compile it, flash it onto your machine. And in particular, we're going to cover a few things that I think will be fun uh, things for you to add to your own printer. So for example, the printer we will be looking at today will be an Ender 3 Pro, correct? Yeah. And it's got a Creality 422 board, which is uh, the standard board that uh, Creality has been putting in since mid-2020, I think. And the, uh, you know, if, if you have an Ender 3 Pro and you want to put a BL Touch on, that's something we'll cover today. And we'll also cover how do we add that custom boot screen. So to start with, let me do this. So I'm going to switch our view over a little bit. So we're all zoomed in on my face. And then I'm going to go over here to OBS. Where'd you go, OBS? Uh, here we go. And I'm going to minimize this. So Durbin, let me know if um, you can still see and hear me because I can no longer see my uh, StreamYard screen. Okay. Can you, can you still see and hear me? Yes. Okay, sweet. So then I'm going to transition this over. Can you see this now? Yep. Okay, so... Uh, we're just going to test this out. So we should be able to see that I'm saying hi to you over here. So this is my shell. Um, if you are on Windows, Mac OS, or Linux, these instructions will work. However, I'm going to do a few things in the shell, and these will not be applicable to Windows users, and you will have to do a little digging yourself how to replace them, but that should be pretty minimal. So right now I'm going to open up my browser. So let's drag this over here. So here's my browser. We've got the very helpful teaching tech calibration guide open, but instead we are going to go to the Marlin GitHub page. And so for those of you at home, you will be able to see this is the address right here, github.com slash Marlin firmware slash Marlin. But if you just search Marlin GitHub, this should pop up. So we are going to go over here down to this section here, releases. And let me zoom in a little bit so it's a little easier to see. Is that <coughs> a, little, a little better? Yeah, that's a little more legible. Uh, so let me open this up. So we got our little Marlin down here. So we're going to go here to the releases. Um, you can grab the latest version of whatever it is when you're doing this. Right now, this is Marlin 2.1.1. The critical thing is we want a Marlin 2 version. If for whatever reason you're looking at the wrong thing and it does not say Marlin 2, that's bad. We don't want Marlin 1. Marlin 1 is very old at this point, and uh, we will not get a lot of the fancy, fancy features that we get in Marlin 2 if we get this older version. So over here on this releases page, we can see uh, good old Scott, think he had, um, has been making some changes here. He has been a major force, the major force behind Marlin since its inception. Um, we're going to scroll down here. So these are all just different changes that have been made since the last release. You can see this is a very actively developed project. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of changes every release. And new releases come out with uh, quite a bit of frequency. So we're going to come down here and we're going to grab this source code zip. So we're going to grab it, download. I have already downloaded this, so I'm not going to re-download it. You can see it's right here in my uh, downloads, Marlin 2.1.1.zip. Then I'm going to come up here 
to Marlin Firmware again, and I'm, we're going to go to Configurations. So what's going on here is Marlin Firmware is distributed both as a base set of firmware. Wait, let me go back here. Uh, so if I go to the this main repository with all the, the Marlin files in it, if we go inside this Marlin directory, inside here we have these two files called configuration.h and configuration underscore advance.h. And so inside here will be the set of configurations that Marlin uses to compile things. So a little bit of background on what's going on here. Um, Marlin is written in a language called C++. And the way this uh, uh, Marlin is compiled, these things are macros. And we use this like define keyword here to set a macro either to just exist, which you can see like, for example, here, this is just setting uh, this to exist so that if we check that uh, it's defined and does in fact exist, uh, it'll pop up. Right. So like right now, because these slash slash is here, this is commented out and will not uh, be defined. So if we had a block below that said, if not defined, show custom boot screen, that uh, bit of code that follows that would be executed because right now show custom boot screen is not defined. However, show boot screen is defined right here because it's not commented. And you can see that in um, the GitHub uh, file viewer here, it's colorized because it is not a comment. It is uh, actively in use. So um, show boot screen is an example of all, all we need to do is define it. But then we can also come down here and we can see that the other way we can use a macro is we can actually set values uh, to the macro. So here we're defining serial port to be an integer value here, just zero. Um, so with this configuration file, we set a bunch of different macros which control how the compiler actually constructs uh, the resulting firmware binary. So for example, um, we set the motherboard to uh, this ramps board here. And when we go back over here, and look in uh, source, pins, uh, ramps. Uh, I, I forget now which exact board it was that it said, E something or other. But point being, uh, every uh, motherboard will have a pins file here. And so inside the pins file, we will be explicitly setting like, OK, I have, uh, for example, a filament runout sensor and it needs a pin in order to communicate with the firmware. And I'm setting which pin uh, the filament runout sensor is on. And so let me switch back to this camera for a second. So if I just grab a random board, so I've got like a random Board. What did I grab? This is a, an SKR 1.3 board, right? So I've got my SKR board here. Um, if I set my uh, pins incorrectly, then it will try to use the wrong section of the board, right? So the, this pins file is very important. But if someone else has already done the legwork for setting up a pins file for your board, um, you don't have to do that, you know, meddle with anything in here. Instead, you just make the change in your configuration.h, and it will correctly use all the pins that someone else you know, thoughtfully laid out for you. So in almost every case, unless you're working on a very, very new printer uh, or a very, very new board, uh, someone will probably have done the legwork for you there. So um, we got a little off track talking about the pin. So let me uh, <laughs> hop back here for a sec. So we wanted to go into uh, this Marlin firmware uh, user. 
And so underneath this user, they will have the configurations. And so these configurations are for different printer and board combinations, right? So like if I go in here under examples and I say, I, I don't know, uh, let's say I have a Flash Forge Creator Pro. So for the Flash Forge Creator Pro, I have a configuration.h which when I look for the motherboard, it should set the, the board correctly, which in turn will set the pins correctly. So because someone has already built this for us, if this was our printer, we could just use these pre-built settings. And so that is exactly what you want to do the vast majority of the time. So for example, today we will be using a Creality Ender 3 Pro using a Creality 422 board. Then uh, we can just check in here and it should say that we're using a V4 Creality board and that will in turn use the V4 Creality pens. So that's what we wanna see. So in order to, to use uh, this configuration, you can download the, the configuration manually but it's perhaps easier to just do the same thing we did before. Go to uh, our releases page, scroll down through all the wondrous changes that have happened since then, and grab our source code zip file. One thing that is very important to do in order to save yourself time, if you get a version that's mismatched between your configurations and your Marlin uh repository that you downloaded if it's if i had 2.0.9.3 for example um and i downloaded that that would not work the uh compiler would throw a error during pre-processing which would just spit something up that says hey we looked at the version of your configuration files and the version of everything else and we don't think it matches you cannot continue. So if you want to save yourself time, make sure these two numbers match. So we've downloaded it. We've got it here. So configurations 211, Marlin 211. So we are going to now uh, go back to our uh, shell here. And we can actually, you know, let's not do it, Michelle. Let's just do it here. So... Um, uh, it's, it's still just showing you. Yeah, so... Uh, you know what? Like we are doing it in the shell because I forget how to navigate to my home directory. Uh, <laughs> embarrassing. So inside here, we have all of the files that we're going to use. Don't worry about these for right now. These are for something later. But right now, we've got our Marlin zip and our configuration zip. So what we want to do is unzip these. So in order to unzip them, uh, uh, it's it's not showing your screen. Oh, it's not it's not showing my screen. No, no, no. Um, okay, give me one sec. Uh, nope. Okay, so. This is me, and then let me minimize this again. Sorry. Sorry for that. Okay. Is it showing my screen now? Yeah. Okay. So now we want to unzip the configurations file, and then we're going to unzip the Marlin file. So on Windows and Mac OS, you can simply just click on them to unzip uh, on, on Linux, you know, if you want to do something similar to what I just did, which is just run the unzip command. But now we should have two new directories. So one, uh, this is configurations folder. So if we look inside here, we will have uh, the stuff that we were looking at on the GitHub page. So config examples, Creality, Ender 3, Pro, Creality B, 422. So inside we have this configuration and configuration advanced file. So this is exactly what we're going to need. And then similarly, if we look inside Marlin, we've got a ton of stuff in here. So 
what you're going to want to do is now that we have these unzipped, we're going to go over into our browser and we're going to go to search for VS Code. So I have already bookmarked this. So we're going to go here, code.visualstudio.com. And over here, we should have a download button that lets us download whatever kind we want. We want to grab the stable version of whatever your platform is. So we have the 64-bit uh, versions of Windows, Mac, and Linux available here. Um, if you have uh, another setup, there is other downloads, but right now we're just going to hit download Mac Universal. So I have already installed this, but it would just provide me with the installer. I would click run. We've got our install complete. So once that's complete, we're going to need two additional things. So the next thing is platform IO. So what platform IO is, is it's a tool specifically for uh, hooking up with VS code that does a lot of the legwork for you in terms of running commands. And so we are a fundamentally lazy group of people. We don't want to have to run a bunch of messy, gross commands ourselves. So instead we get platform IO and that will wrap the commands in a very tidy fashion. And then it will provide an interface, which our next tool will, will use, which is uh, also from the Marlin GitHub page. It is called Auto Build Marlin. And so what this will do is it will provide us with a single uh, tab in VS Code, which has some buttons in it, which I'll show you how to use. But you literally just click a button and it will clean up or build or show you errors, so on. And so you can it's view this as like a few different levels of abstraction, right? Like the Marlin uh, code itself, when we grab just the Marlin code, we can just like build it using make files and commands that's painful and annoying. So we can go one step above that and use platform IO and wrap a lot of that annoyingness in platform IO commands or go even further and wrap that in just a button that we press. And so if you uh, open up VS Code, so I've got VS Code open now. So I just wanted to say you can find both of them within the extensions. Uh, that is correct. So we once you have this open, we're going to go to the extensions page, which is this one that looks like a, a square with rounded corners and uh, one fourth of it taken out. So this thing right here. Yeah, what is um, <laughs> so you're going to uh, pretend I don't have these installed, right? So we're going to go platform IO. It's going to pop up. You're going to hit install, right? It should look like this little orange alien head. Once that's done installing, you may have an issue, which is it does not always correctly install its dependency. So one of the things it depends on is this guy right here. This C, C++ plugin from Microsoft. So we're going to install that. And then finally, we're going to search for auto build Marlin. And then that will bring up auto build Marlin. And we're going to hit install on that. So once that is complete, you should have, when you go to your extensions page, um, you should have three installed extensions over here in this tab. And it should look very similar to this. We're then going to do uh, this. We're going to open a folder. And we are going to go to wherever we downloaded our Marlin and extracted it. And we're going to open up this top directory. So this is a, uh, a pain point for a lot of people. If you open uh, this Marlin directory, bad things happen. A lot of the tools that you expect to work correctly don't. That's because you should not be opening that. You should be opening this top one. So we're going to open that up. Uh, Yes, we want to trust the authors. Now, it should automatically open up a few tabs 
up here. So it should open up your platform IO dot ionize. This is your like uh, configuration for platform IO. We're going to leave this alone. We don't care. Then it should open up your PIO platform IO homepage. We also don't care. The thing that we do care about is this board, uh, this tab right here, which is the auto build Marlin tab. So these are the buttons I mentioned before. So we have buttons to build, upload, and then once we get a run going, there will be an additional button to clean. So before we do that, we are going to actually make changes to the code. So in order to do that, um, we're I'm going to open up my terminal again. So this is how I would do it, but you can literally just drag the files over if you want. So what we're going to do is we're going to copy the configurations file for our particular board. So this is going to be configurations slash config slash examples. Then the brand of the printer manufacturer, then the exact printer you have, right? So in our case, it's an Ender 3 Pro, followed by the board in question. So here it's going to be a Creality V422. And then we're going to copy over all the .h files. So we want this, the boot screen, the status screen, configuration.h, configuration advance.h. So we're going to copy that inside our directory like this. So if we miss, right? So if we copy it into the wrong directory here, that would, uh, things will break. So if you copy it to this top directory, which has like, the um, you know docker compose .yaml. if you copy it in there uh, it's it's not gonna be the compiler's not going to be able to find the .h files and they're going to be ignored if you copy it somewhere else it's not going to work it's got to be inside uh, Marlin slash Marlin right so if we look inside there now we have uh, all of our files and if we look at the timestamps we can see we just copied the configuration.h and configuration advance.h over, as well as the boot screen and status screen. So that all looks good. Before we make any other changes, we're going to try compiling because, uh, like a lot of things, we don't want to make too many changes at once. We want to try the simplest thing, check to see if it works. If it works, great. If not, we know that the error we made was has already happened right so we are going to go to the auto build marlin tab if it's for whatever reason failed to open you want to make sure your uh the window under this like file explorer window has a lot of these values in it make file platform io dot ini docker compose if it has that you've probably got the right directory open um and you want to make sure there is a platform IO head down here underneath extensions and a Marlin M underneath extensions. So we're going to click auto build Marlin and then hit show ABM panel and it'll open up this tab that opened automatically for us. Okay. So looking in here, we can see firmware Marlin 2.1.1. That looks good. That's what we want to see. The config. So here, if we uh, make changes and we want to remember that this is our file, we can put our um, name in there, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. The machine name is set in configuration.h as well. Extruders, same thing. Board, same thing. Pin, same thing. Okay. So what is going to happen here is we're going to choose the correct environment. So... One thing to take note of, so down here it says Maple. So what Maple is, is back in the day, history lesson, not that long of history, but you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, there was a very different math library in use by Marlin called Maple, Lib Maple. And so a lot of environments will end in Maple. You almost never want maple. Unless you know what you're doing, don't click maple. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to make sure this value right here matches our expectation. So this is a description of the architecture. There are guides online on how to read these. So if you know what processor you have, so like I have a 32-bit ARM processor with this much memory, you can say, okay, this is the one that matches. Probably it's the first one. Good rule of thumb. So we are going to try this one out. And if it fails, because 512 kilobytes of uh, flash is too much, we can switch to this one. But this is what we want for the 422. So we are going to hit build, right? So a, a good call out. Uh, a, I, I don't know why it just failed there, but uh, whatever. Uh, so we need to be inside our Marlin directory here. So this um, down here, uh, when you click build, it will open up this little pane down here. So our pane will show a few things. We've got problems. So if there are issues, it will pop them up down here. We've got output. So if any of our uh, compilation or code or whatever is creating output, it will appear down here. If we're running a debugger, which we will not be, it will appear down here. And finally, the terminal. So this is probably where you want to be because it shows you the output. The, the errors are usually marked in here, and we can actually run commands ourselves. So you can see above this button, when I press it, literally is just running this command right here. And so if we parse this command, right, it's literally just saying, run the command platform io run the sub command run do it silently so we don't want a ton of uh output using this environment which as you can see matches the uh environment name that we clicked to build on and then wait for the output until uh we've got done echoed to to this don't worry about this don't worry about that okay so we are going to hit build so now you can see, because we're in the right directory, it is actually starting to build. If we uh, edit out this silent command, we'll see a huge amount of info on everything it's compiling. The good news is it will cache the things that it compiles uh, pretty intelligently. So the first time you run it, when you have uh, nothing compiled yet, it will take significantly longer than the second time you compile it when it has a lot of things cached. So uh, while we're waiting, let me just uh, switch back to my StreamYard tab and ask you, how, how are we doing so far? Is, uh, are there any questions? Are, uh, am I moving too fast, too slow? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I, I wasn't sure if you're asking me or... If... I am asking you. Yeah. Oh, I, I, it's kind of a lot to take in, but it, I don't think we're moving too fast. It's just okay. a... It, there's just a lot of to the subject matter. Yeah. 100%. And <laughs> yeah. I, I have made some degree of effort to explain a lot of the, the steps, but on some level, you don't really need to understand what's going on so far. The, the important thing so far are you went to uh, Marlin's GitHub page and you downloaded the configurations uh, zip file and the Marlin zip file with matching numbers. You then unzipped those. You went to the VS Code website and downloaded VS Code for your platform. You opened the extensions tab in VS Code and installed auto build Marlin platform IO and the C tools from Microsoft. And then you went to the open folder option in VS code and opened the Marlin, uh, the, the Marlin folder copied over the configuration files you plan to use into the correct Marlin slash Marlin directory. You'll know it's correct because there are already configuration.h files in there. Then you went to the auto build Marlin tab and hit uh, build. Okay, so 
that is the executive summary of what we've been doing so far. So I'm going to transition back over here and we can see that this appears to have worked. So this over here, this is just a weird bug that just started popping up recently. Don't worry about this. If this is in green and it shows you built firmware, it worked. That's, that's what matters. And we can verify that if we, copy this command the first part of the command and run it again without silent it should actually show you uh like i think the way it words is done success right in all caps so this is all good we can just look in here for warnings which will still pop up so in here is a common warning you'll see with creality boards specifically that uh it's not 100% sure about which stepper drivers are on the board. So um, if you have a board like this one. This is the part that always trips me up and makes me second so guess things. If you have a board like this one where there's a bunch of like empty pins down here, what that's for is... What's that for is so that you can grab little stepper drivers like this and actually insert them into the board. And so if you're doing that, right, like we just inserted one. Um, if you're doing that, you need to pay very conscious attention to what stepper drivers you used and set them in the, the firmware. And we'll talk about this in a bit. But if you have a board like the one we're using today or dude, I have too many boards out. I can't find the one I'm looking for. Um, <laughs> or like this one, for example, that has integrated stepper drivers. In that case, you uh, most of the time don't need to change anything. So this is just a special case where Creality made the very poor decision to manufacture a board with integrated stepper drivers and then flip flop on which integrated stepper driver they're using you can double check by looking at your board and uh peering at the little section that connects to each of the the steppers right so these um pin headers right here are uh for connecting to your steppers right like you um like one will go to your extruder your z your x your y and so on um you want to like look um where the usually there will be a uh like a heat sink on them, not always, but often. And uh, adjacent to that, there will often be a marking that lets you know which stepper driver it is. Um, if you have any doubt, I would ask the manufacturer, look at the manufacturer's pin out, or just ask someone to help you online because having the wrong stepper drivers means your firmware will not behave correctly. So in this particular case, the default that is used for uh, uh, 422 boards in Marlin by default, I believe, is the uh, TMC 2208s, which is the most common. So one thing we can do right now is we can just sort of double check. So if you have the, the board in a visible place, um, uh, I guess... Do you have the board in a visible place? I have a board in a visible place. Okay. Is it a Creality 422? It is. Um, can you grab that? And then we'll take a... Let me switch back to just my camera. And then I'm going to open up StreamYard. And then we're going to just switch positions. So looking at that, um, can we uh, tell what stepper driver is on there? Not clearly. Um, okay. um, so there's a lot written on a very small yeah, place. It is very, very <coughs> and there's usually a ton of information just sort of on these boards. Um, while you're looking at that, I'm going to uh, just take another look here at the uh, code over here. So yeah, if you get a warning like this, that's what this means. It's just double check <coughs> the correct stepper driver because it may perform 
poorly, overheat, etc. if you are using the incorrect stepper drivers. Um, I don't think that's an issue, almost certainly. They are TMC 2208s, unless you got very unlucky, but uh, I'm pretty let's sure just, that's right. Let's just say that we aren't unlucky and we got uh, 2208s. So in that case, what we are going to do is we are going to uh, just look for our firmware. So our firmware will, our firmware will be in a uh, folder called PIO build, then the name of the environment. So for us, STM32F103RE, um, followed by the name that's given right here. And so depending on what board it is and the format that they take their dot bin, which is just like a binary file, what format they take their uh, binaries in, uh, the name will be different. But for Creality version 4 boards, so 422 and 427 boards, they will be given as firmware-date-timestamp. Um, so the good news is, because of that, they will always be unique. And so we can keep a, a bunch of <coughs> old firmware binaries in a location somewhere, totally unlabeled, and they won't in, uh, bump into each other. Some boards will only take a file named e.g. firmware.bin, in which case we will need to have a more clever naming scheme in order to keep multiple copies of the firmware binary, because otherwise they will sort of uh, their names will collide. So we've got our uh, firmware binary here. Now is when we would test that it works. So um, down here somewhere, I'm not going to find it. You're, everyone here has seen a SD card reader and an SD card and has plugged one into their printer, right? So what we would do is grab our USB stick with our SD card. We're going to plug the SD card into our little USB SD reader, plug it into our computer, and then we are going to copy this firmware binary over there, eject the SD card safely, unplug it, turn off our printer, plug the SD card in, power it on. It should take slightly longer than usual, and it should boot on. If it does boot on and shows you the, the Marlin screen, uh, that means it flashed successfully and we can uh, use our printer firmware. However, today we want to actually go a little deeper than that and we want to make some changes to the firmware that are a little interesting. So first thing we're going to do before we actually try and flash anything onto the printer is we are going to... Um, we are going to take a look at how we make a custom boot screen. And so the uh, sausage is made in a much less intimidating fashion than one might think based on how cool they look, right? So what we're going to do is we are going to open a new tab and we're going to go to the, the Marlin main page, right? So this is our Marlin main page. Um, and it's selling us on all of the wonderful features of Marlin. We are then going to go to tools. And underneath the tools section in this header here, there is something called bitmap converter. So we're going to click on that. That will bring us to this JavaScript tool here. Um, and we will be able to click browse, select a file from our computer, and uh, upload it. And then actually tinker with these settings to generate the code that we need to use one of these files. So I have taken the liberty of already, uh, well, you sent me this file. Wait, where did it go? So if you can see this, uh, this is your logo, correct? Yeah. And so this has already been uh, scaled down nicely to be a little 64 by 64 pixel uh, photo. And this is exactly what we want. So uh, an example of another one I made, the, the one that was actually in the 
sort of title card for this video was this one. Um, notably, when you scale images down to be uh, quite small, because this uh, the, the maximum dimensions this will take is 128 by 64. Um, when you scale images down to be small, they often look like dog shit, right? And so if that's happening, one thing I would recommend is you want to uh, open this, uh, your small little file up in a photo editing tool like Photoshop or GIMP. And you want to uh, do the scale down process to the size, reset the canvas size to uh, your new tiny image. So like for reference, this is like Omega zoomed. This is uh, like, this is already 200% scale right here. So when we were like looking at it like this, this is 800% scale. So what we've done uh, with this one is we, I manually went in here and just like using the uh, pixel size brush, uh, manually touched up a lot of the sections to get it very starkly black and white because that tends to look better. Here, this will almost certainly look quite good still because it's got a lot of contrast and reasonably sharp lines, even though it's not uh, just a two color index black and white, but that's, that's okay, this will look good. So we've got uh, our 64 by 64 pixel image now. Um, I used um, in Inkscape and it has a, like an auto trace and you can click okay. simplify and it will it will make it more simple than it already is to, as well. Okay. So um, we, once, I, I guess you export this from uh, Inkscape or in this case GIMP, we then have a PNG or JPEG, um, which is maximally 64 by 128. And then we are going to go back here, right? We're going to open up uh well here since i already have this one open in the other tab we're just going to do it with the out of battery logo so we're going to open this up right and so now it will display up in this top left area here a preview of what it will look like um for reference if your thing is smaller than the maximum width it will actually just center it so this will sort of like be in the middle of a field of blue here um we want to make sure Marlin 2.x is selected because uh, the way it used to work for Marlin 1 was different. We um, can play with these other settings, but the important one is uh, boot. So if you do bitmap, it will just generate a uh, sort of C array of these values, which you can then manually use. But because we explicitly want a boot screen, we're going to hit boot here, and now it's generating a new file that looks like this but we can do other fun things so we can do things like uh changing the color pattern so that uh, the ones that were off are now on and vice versa or we can um uh set this to use ascii art over here so we can actually see our nice little image even still, you can see in the ones and zero values over here, the outline of our image, which is pretty cool. So this is what we're going to grab. So in this particular case, we've got it open over here. We've got boot, binary, ASCII art, Marlin 2. So that looks good. So we're going to uh, mouse over that to select all of it. And then we are going to um, open a new file called boot screen. Uh, dot h so i'm just using the editor i normally use but uh is that vim that is vim um, wild <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, here you can see our nice little uh image over here whoopsies um so we can see our nice little image over here we've got the x uh, the X is for I smiley face here. And we're just going to save this file. So now we have a new file called bootscreen.h right here. And so we're going to replace our old bootscreen file with that. So we're going to do bootscreen.h 
Marlin slash Marlin. And then we can double check that this is the correct thing. Yes. So we already have our boot screen file here. So we're moving boot screen on top of this. We can do this in Finder or Windows Explorer or whatever. But the technique is the same. We're creating a new file, adding the text to it, saving the file, replacing the file. So now if I go into uh, VS Code here, I open up boot screen. We should, in fact, see our lovely little uh, new logo that will appear on boot. So if we go into status screen, the status screen we can change. But for right now, let's just leave it as is. So this will be the status screen that comes by default with Marlin uh, for the Ender 3 Pro. Okay. So we've made our change. So when we come back to the auto build Marlin tab, we are going to hit build again. If we hit clean in this particular instance, uh, when nothing has failed, we won't really benefit from a lot of the advantages of caching. But if you're having issues with it not building correctly, just hit clean. It's easy. So we'll do that just to make the point so we're building it, uh, everything from scratch again so it'll take a second to compile everything but we should have our new boot screen so now we have marlin with all the default parameters for the ender 3 pro and creality version 422 board but we've got our special fancy boot screen so the next step will be let's uh let's say we installed a new hot end okay and we want to be able to print nylon on our fancy new all metal hot end so let's take a look at how we're going to change that i'm also going to stop using vim to edit things because i feel like I'm going to alienate the audience and just <laughs> Vim is hardcore for sure. <laughs> um, let's go to uh, over here. So, um, so now we've opened up configuration.h, right? Um, and so in configuration.h, uh, this is the issue, though, is I don't know how to use VS Code. Okay, here we go. Um, so we are going to want to search for this. So we want to find max temp. So a, a little bit of background on how the thermistor works in Marlin. This is not super important to understand, but uh, I think it is will be enlightening for people who want to know a little bit more about thermistors. So the thermistor essentially... Uh, there are a bunch of values in a table for each thermistor, which govern how the thermistor is interpreted. And so the way uh, the thermistor works in Marlin is you set for each sensor you have. So like temp sensor zero, for example, um, which will be the temp sensor for your hot end and temp sensor bed will be for your bed. Um, temp sensor zero is set to one. So let's figure out what one means. So we scroll up here, and so this will show us all of our potential thermistor settings. We get down to one, we can see this is the value for EPCOS uh, thermistor. So these are just the, the super cheap standard thermistors that tons and tons of uh, 3D printers are running they um are by like two orders of magnitude are the most popular thermistors in 3d printing and as a result they get to be the default so behind the scenes what is happening here is when we set this value to one um or this value down here rather where did it go temp sensor zero to one that is telling uh marlin when it's compiling hey they are using an EPCOS thermistor, you should go look in your thermistor tables for the values associated with specifically the uh, uh, thermistor table one, which has all of these things for EPCOS thermistors. 
So we have an EPCO's thermistor for temp sensor zero, so our hot end and our bed. Probably, unless you have a very fancy printer or are living a very different life than me in general, you do not have seven or eight thermistors. Yeah, that's crazy. crazy. However, if you do have like you know two hot ends attached to the same printer for whatever reason, the the zero like the first hot end which has an index of zero will be this one. And the second hot end, which has an index of one will be this one, right? So we are going to, once we've set our thermistor value correctly, which we have, unless we've changed our thermistor, we are gonna take a look at this section down here. So this here, so we will set a minimum temperature per thermistor and a maximum temperature per thermistor. So we're not gonna change our minimum temperature of zero, um, but we are gonna change our maximum temperature of 275. So when uh, Marlin describes your maximum temperature, really what it means is that is uh, the maximum temperature at which point it will count any value it gets over that as a thermal runaway. And like it will be as bad and your firmware will crash and your printer will shut down. And so in between your uh, like true maximum printing temperature and the thermal runaway temperature, is, which is what max temp probably should have been called, is something called overshoot. So overshoot is basically like we need a little bit of runway in between the temperature we're actually printing at and the point where the firmware is going to crash because it's viewed as dangerously hot. So that if the t the heater swings around a little bit too much and we go, you know, 3 degrees over or whatever, it's not viewed as a catastrophic failure. So that's what this value here is, hot end overshoot. So we need to keep in mind that it's 15 degrees. And the other thing we need to keep in mind is that EPCO's thermistors, the thermistor table uh, and spec for uh, EPCO's thermistors is only defined up to 300C. And so it's actually not advisable nor really possible without doing a lot of very dangerous tinkering to print hotter uh, than about 285 on an EPCO's thermistor. So what we are going to do is we are going to set this value to, uh, I don't know, let's say 300. So that is the max our EPCO's thermistor can actually sense up to. And this will be the point where we get a thermal runaway, right? And so our actual temperature will be 300 degrees minus our hot end overshoot, which is 15. So we will be able to print in theory and probably in practice up to 285 degrees. One thing to keep in mind about thermal runaways, which I think uh, is an important topic to cover, is how heaters work behind the scenes. So behind the scenes, printers can, uh, heaters can operate in one of two modes. So the first mode is called bang, bang. And what bang, bang is, is the logic is very simple. If the current temperature of the sensor is less than the desired, like target temperature, turn the heater on. And if it is greater than the target temperature, turn the heater off. And you can imagine uh, that results in a lot of sort of swinging around the target temperature, which is very simple, but has downsides, right? Like some materials don't like being printed that way. Uh, the more exotic you get, the worse that probably is to, to print with. And so the solution to that is to use something called a PID loop. And so the way you should think about a PID loop is 
instead of doing the simplest possible thing of just checking the current temperature and turning off and on, instead, the printer is using uh, a sophisticated guessing mechanism to say, okay, this is my current temperature. I know I've been heating at this rate for a little while. So when I get to this new target temperature in this many seconds, I should probably turn the temperature off early so that I coast up to the correct temperature and then I stay there. And so the idea is that it should theoretically smooth out the uh, heating profile of the heater. In practice, though, the actual behavior of the PID loop for the heater is super strongly dependent on a few values down here. So if uh, you can see right here, I've got PID temp enabled. So PID temp will say, hey, for the hot end, we should be using a PID loop to manage the heater. Um, down here, uh, right here, we have uh, our P and our I and our D. And so if these values are well tuned, right, like in quotation marks, then the heater will be much better than bang, bang. If we just put in random values we make up and are just completely off base, it will perform much, much worse than bang, bang. So as a result, don't tinker with these unless you know what you're doing, A. And B, if your hot end is different than the hot end that this configuration.h file uh, is sort of mapped to, I, you upgraded to a volcano or whatever, these will almost certainly be very, very wrong. You will need to change them. But you can leave them as is in your actual firmware and instead do an M303. So Oh, yeah. Marlin supports actually tuning your PID parameters from within the, the already compiled firmware, uh, either using the interface or um, using a uh, like terminal into the printer over serial like Octoprint. So, um, uh, for example, here we could just run M303. E0 means our uh, extruder zero, which is our hot end, uh, for eight cycles at 210 degrees Celsius. That will spit out our PID parameters. That's not actually what we want to do. We want to actually use this U flag. So it should be at the end of this U1. And that will tell it, hey, I don't want you to just spit out the parameters. I want you to actually use the parameters that you generate. And then once you've finished running that, you can go down here, M500, and this will save the resulting values to EEPROM, which is essentially the way uh, your printer will store any information it needs to operate the firmware that is not compiled into the firmware. Okay. Is there a, is there a point when... Because like I think its default cycle is five. There's like default cycles of five or something like that. Is there a point when adding cycles no longer is beneficial? So, uh, I I think the answer is it depends. And you know, adding 120 cycles, way overkill. You don't need to do that. But uh, it may be the case that you're seeing a, a more accurate tune at eight cycles than five. And so it may be worth it to you since you don't PID tune super often to just add a few extra cycles in there. My default number, which may or may not be just a uh, habit is eight. I don't know why I decided to do eight in the past, but I always just do eight when I'm tuning PID. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, PID. Okay, so let's scroll back up here. So the change that we just made is this. So we added support for the maximum temperature increasing to 300 degrees Celsius. 
that will actually allow us to print at max temp minus overshoot. So 300 minus 15 is 285. And so now if we have uh, a nylon or a polycarbonate that prints at 270, we can safely print with that as long as we have upgraded our hot end. So now that we've made this change, we're going to go back here and we're going to build again. So now we've done a build with it uh, with no changes made. Then we did another build with uh, just the boot screen altered. And then we made a rebuild just now to increase the max temp. So I think there are a lot of features where like we could just keep doing this and talking about them all night. So what I think might be a good idea um, would be to talk a little bit about the BL touch in particular. And I think the reason the BL touch is probably a, a good option here is it requires making quite a few changes. So it is more involved, but it constrain uh, sort of narrows our focus down. So we aren't just talking about every feature that's available and the ones that I like, etc. So does that seem like a good plan to you, Durbin? Yeah, no, totally. Um, and before we do that, um, I just want to double check. Is there any uh, anything that I was like going too fast or skipped over that you want to delve into a little deeper right now? Um, no, no. I think I think you're explaining everything incredibly well, like <laughs> incredibly well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so if we are doing a BL touch next, um, I am going to show you a cheat. So the cheat is that we are going to use Google. <laughs> so add bl touch to ender 3 pro with um uh, it's funny with, in my opinion it's harder to find firmware without bl touch for an ender 3 pro <laughs> right there are so many guides and i i think that's a good call out because frankly prior uh, you know, out, outside of GunCAD, printing in high temp exotics is quite a bit less pos uh, quite a bit less uh, valued because you know you don't really need your baby Yoda print or whatever to be in nylon <laughs> X. So, um, as a result, a, a lot of the guys that are doing uh, printer tutorials, the first time they really need to compile their own firmware. Um, unless they're just ricing the boot screen, is to specifically add a BL touch. And so let's just take a look at this, right? So uh, I have never been on this page, so we don't know exactly what's in here. Okay, well, some of these are bad. But, uh, <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe this was the wrong way to do it. I'm just going to show you my technique instead. So... What we are going to do is we are going to first open up uh, configuration.h. So let me do this. I'm going to save that. And then where did boot screen go? I'm going to save that. Okay. Wait, did I just insert a character? I don't think so. Okay. Command, All right. Maybe Zoom. we are just going back to Vim. I know how to use Vim. Okay. So um, we're going to go inside Marlin. So you don't have to do it this way. You can just edit it directly in VS Code, but I'm bad at VS Code. So we're going to do it my way instead so that I can be sort of more um, fluid while I'm doing this. So um, we're going to just hop down here and just make sure our changes stuck. 
So we can see our heater zero is at 300. Our overshoot is what we expected. We haven't changed the PI and D parameters. So now one thing uh, we can just briefly insert in here. Um, so in here, uh, if you notice, this is just like a bit lower. Uh, so up here is like where the PID temperature controls are for the hot end. Then this is the value for the PID temperature controls for the bed. And similarly for the chamber, we, we don't have a chamber. We are going to use the PID tuning for the bed. Um, a good thing to call out is the bed PID temp settings uh, seem finny, finickier than uh, the hot end in my experience. And so a lot of times if you add PID temp bed unexpectedly to your printer and these uh, parameters are off a bit, you will get a thermal runaway from your bed. So make sure you do the same thing uh, that we discussed before the M303 um, to your bed. But as you can see right here, find your own, uh, you want to use E minus one. So this is like uh, a special notation that they use to say, this is not one of the hot ends, this is specifically the bed. Um, okay, so we're gonna scroll down here. And you can see there are these two things that are currently commented out. Um, and this bit right here says, if any of these macros are defined above, which it will be. So we have PID temp and PID temp bed defined, but not PID temp chamber. Um, then it will actually go in here and attempt to execute these things. These two, we don't want to change, but... We do want to add the PID edit menu and the PID auto tune menu because entering G code commands by hand is cringe. And we want, we have plenty of uh, space in our flash memory right now. And so we should abuse it and use it to actually add a menu item. So as a result, when you go to, uh, you know, using the little scrolly wheel, if you click settings, there will now be a PID edit option and a PID tune option. Okay, so now that we've added that, we are going to scroll back to the top. So this is uh, the top of the file. And so we can um, edit our config author and we're gonna put Cape and Durbin. <laughs> um, then, we want to make sure that we're showing our boot screen, right? So boot screen looks good. Our boot screen is custom, so we want this to be enabled. So uh, again, remember that if it's like this, that means it's disabled. And if we delete these two characters in front, it will become enabled. So right now we are uh, using a custom status and boot screen, which is good. Um, we're using our... Creality version four motherboard. Um, unless you know what you're doing, uh, don't change the serial port or baud rate. If you are having an issue with a board where you, uh, when you connect to it over serial, you are just getting what is seemingly random characters and noise, it's probably the case the baud rate you're using to connect to it is wrong. The most common uh, baud rate to connect for 3D printers and to be honest, electronics in general is uh, 1152.00 and uh, the second most common is 25, uh, 250K. So uh, here we go. We are going to keep scrolling down. So we can set a machine name here. So this will actually be shown on uh, the info page. So we're going to change this to Durbin's Ender 3 Pro, and we don't care that it's 1.5. <laughs> um, is, there, is there a way to add a way to choose the amount of cycles in a PID too? Um, sorry, what was that? Is there a way to change the number of cycles in a PID tune? 
like that you could set because I think, like I said, it was you were saying it's you use eight, but I, I, I think on the firmware I have on my under five, it does five. Like, is there uh, a way to like change that and not like using the dial? Um, actually, I don't think that there is, but we can actually just find out. So let's see. So we are just gonna search in here for. Uh... Uh... No, it doesn't look like there is. It does not. Uh, so essentially what I did was I, I just looked um, in the code where we are actually using that macro. So you can see here, this. so now this is actually the code that will be compiled, right? And you can see in this... Uh, function here we've got uh advanced settings temperature helpers is a comment just helping us out but we've got this right here so it says if we have a macro called pid auto tune menu enabled we should go in here and take a look at all of these right and in particular what i wanted to look for is there should be a function that actually does all the heavy lifting here. And so here it's called LCD auto tune and it's going to actually run a G code command using this sprint F P uh, function right here. And so that is going to take a, a command and then uh, fill in these values right here. So you can see what it's actually running behind the hood is M three Oh three u1 which is that uh flag i mentioned before to actually use it the e flag which is going to be set to this hid which is the heater id value um and then s uh the s flag which is actually the target temperature for the tune so if uh if this instead said something like uh i don't know c percent yeah for like the the cycles uh, and then, you know, if we've somehow knew where we were getting cycles, if it looked like that, then we could actually manually set the cycles. But because it doesn't, um, we are not using the cycles. So you can see then after it generates this uh, string and puts it in CMD, it then injects it into the G code queue and then runs the G code there. Um, okay. So, uh, we are going to, oh, I was totally wrong earlier. I, I swore the default was 2208s for these, but evidently it's, uh, a 4988. Those are, but if it's working, it's working. We're just going to leave this, uh, unchanged for right now. Um, but if, for example, our driver was a TMC, um, uh, TMC 2208. We would go in here and then manually change these. So TMC 2208. And then uh, we would just replicate that for each of the drivers. So um, on line 162, 163, and 175. Um, okay. So we're going to keep scrolling down. We don't have uh, an eye access. So this this is also you can like do crazy things like have a bunch of extra axes or uh, have independently driven um, steppers that, uh, you know, multiple steppers per access and things like that. So that's less useful for a a bed slinging uh, kinematic arrangement. But if you're doing something with like core XZ or core XY um, or some convoluted belt driven printer, that's non core XY, <laughs> this is where you would, uh, you would start using these uh, other axes. You could uh, set up dual Z access with that as well. Right. That's correct. So 
Notably, though, it should be called out on that front that um, if you have a dual Z where they the two steppers for your Z share the same stepper driver, which is the case on a lot of the EG big tech tree boards, uh, you don't you don't want to tinker with this. Just leave it as it is. Trust that it will work and it probably will. Um, okay, so now we get down here. So we don't need to change this, but this is like, for example, where we would set the uh, extruders to two if we were super fancy and had two extruders. Um, so we're going to keep going down. Um, so switching tool heads. Nope, we are not that fancy. So as you can see, a lot of this is like, uh, either super low level controls that we don't really need to worry about. Like I, I don't need to change how the power supply unit works um, <laughs> or things like super fancy stuff for printers and CNC stuff. That's pretty far removed from, you know, your standard enders or FL sun Delta super racer or whatever they're called. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, th this switching tool head stuff, is, it's not for us, basically. So we're going to keep coming down here. Um, so now we're getting into the thermal settings. So this is where we were looking before at setting the temp sensor. So, for example, if I went to, uh, uh, I don't know, who's a, a common other one. So if I went and got an ATC Semitech 204 GT thermistor, um, and I'm using, you know, my 200 kilo ohm setup here, I would then want to switch my temp sensor zero to two. But because we're using the standard, um, standard epco's thermistor we're going to keep it as one another one to like uh remember because i think a lot more people are using them nowadays are these ones down here these are for the uh rtds instead of traditional thermistors so these are like the pt100 and pt1000 um, they are pretty desirable in the sense that um, they support much much higher temperatures without being crazy expensive or difficult to find um, so let's keep going. So a lot of these things we are, you know, we could tinker with if we knew what we were doing, but we <laughs> don't even care what the temp bed history is. So we're just going to keep scrolling. So we got back down to the section where we're talking about min temp and max temp. So we've changed those for our, uh, extruder, but nothing else. So, uh, a quick note on nomenclature. So Marlin um, makes the interesting decision to call your hot end the extruder. So if you see, you know, E0, that's because E0 is extruder zero, which is your hot end. Um, so we're back to PID settings. We've already changed this. Um, we're just keep scrolling, keep scrolling. You know what? We are just going to do this. So we're going to go here. We're going to see, uh, we're going to turn S curve acceleration on. This uh, is a, a nice tool for reducing vibration. So the, the two classical options there are S curve acceleration and linear advance. However, for most boards, they do not play nice together. So do not enable bo both or you will be suffering. Okay. So now what we've got the, the, the Z probe section. So this is where we will actually talk about the BL touch. So this first one here, Z min probe uses Z min in stop pen. So what's going on here is your, uh, before you have a BL touch, right, you typically have a uh, limiter switch on the Z axis. And that limiter switch is at the minimum side, right? And so if your printer keeps, the gantry keeps lowering until the uh, it flicks 
oh, excuse me, the, the Z min in stop. Um, at the point that's triggered, it'll say, hey, I'm already at the bottom. I can't go any further. I should stop, right? And so that in stop pin um, on a lot of boards, they do not have a Z probe pin for a BL touch. And so if that is the case and your board does not support the Z, uh, Z probe pin, then you should leave this enabled. If your board is like the Creality boards and has a dedicated set of pins for the probe, you want to comment this out because we, um, we don't want to use the Z-Min in-stop pin. And furthermore, using it will be bad once we have the uh, Z in-stop, uh, the, the Z probe plugged in. So if you have a uh, Z in-stop already plugged in, yank it out. We want that unplugged. So we've turned this off, and if we're using the BL Touch, we want to use the Z probe for homing. And the, the reason is we've now removed our Z in stop, so we need some way to clarify to the printer, hey, I'm at the lowest it's possible to go on the Z axis. This is zero. So as a result, we are turning this on. So then we probably don't want to change this. So Z min probe pen. In general, you want to, to leave this pin to whatever it was set to on uh, your pins file, uh, which we talked about at the beginning. So we're going to keep going down. So these are a few different options for how to probe, but we are going to turn on BL Touch. Um, so then the next thing is it should just be like a little bit down nozzle probe offset. So down here uh, is our nozzle probe offset. So the way to think about this is um, this will be how your printer uses the probe information and interpolates where uh, that information with where the nozzle is in the bed. So it already has a nozzle to sort of edge of gantry offset in its brain. So it uses this to sort of compute, hey, uh, this if the pin uh, is within the bounds here, that means the nozzle is within the bounds here. So I'm going to show you a sweet little technique. I'm going to switch. Where did OBS go? Um, so the technique is as follows. So you're going to, if this is the uh, gantry. We're going to lower the gantry all the way to the bed, and then we're going to get a piece of paper, right? And on that piece of paper, we are going to get a pencil, and we're going to slide the piece of paper underneath the nozzle, and then we're going to make a point for the nozzle, right? So we've got our point for the nozzle. Then we are going to make another point with our pencil for the probe. So now we've got two points. Then we're going to imagine that we draw a straight line uh, horizontally through one and vertically through the other, uh, like this. You know, there we see it. There we go. And we're going to draw a third point where they meet. Okay. Now, what we've drawn is the base of a right triangle where the hypotenuse is the line between the pin of the Z probe and the nozzle, right? So if you can see again, there is our little right triangle, right? The values we're interested in, right? So if this is our nozzle and this is our probe, this is our nozzle and this is our probe, the value we're interested in is the two uh, non-hypotenuse values. So this line right here and then this one at the bottom there. So what, uh, if you can see over here, um, this diagram will tell you uh, how to interpret your little triangle, right? So you're going to measure your triangle once you've got it uh, on your piece of paper with some calipers. You're going to say, okay, um, the probe to nozzle is, uh, let's say, to the right. So, you know, 
that means it's going to be positive uh, and back. So it's going to be positive, let's say. Um, so if that's the case, then you're, uh, you know, you're going to measure 10 millimeters and 10 millimeters, at which point you would come down here and edit this offset to be positive 10 and positive 10. Or if we measured, you know, uh, 40 millimeters to the right, or like 43 millimeters to the right, you, uh, you would be positive 43, 43 to the left, negative uh, 43, and so on. So once we have our uh, offset correctly calculated, which um, if you don't have a BL touch right now, let's just fill in uh, some uh, placeholder values for right now. So we're just going to set it to the super, super common 42 and minus 10. This is because there was a classic uh, BL touch mount that was available on Thingiverse. And a lot of the modern BL touch mounts are remixes or redesigns of that mount. And so this particular offset right here is going to be the one you see the most often, but you never know. We're just going to set this as the default one, minus 42, minus 10, and 0. A good rule of thumb about the Z offset, so this is going to be X, Y, and then Z. Z, leave it as 0 unless, for some aberrant, weird reason, you have a difference of, like, 14 millimeters or something. Then set it to 10. You, you want it to be, you know, ballpark within 5 millimeters, but we don't need to get it exactly right because we are going to uh, add a wizard which lets us select that um, within the firmware itself. So um, just quickly, we're going to take a look inside uh, the configuration advanced file. And so we're going to just look for wizard. Um, so the wizard we're talking about is this wizard right here, the probe offset wizard. So we're just going to uncomment that. And suddenly now we have a way to uh, directly change the Z offset within the firmware itself without needing to recompile. So that is all well and good. Then let me see. Ah, so then I'm going to do this. So down here, um, these are the different modes for bed leveling. We have two options here, basically. Two you should be considering using our auto bed leveling bilinear and auto bed leveling UBL. So UBL is fancier. It has a lot more features. But the downside to it is all of the guides online, at least until very recently have been for bilinear, even though UBL has been out for a little while. And a side effect of that is because the parameters you pass the G code are different, it's easy to accidentally set things up for bilinear when you've set UBL. And so I would just exercise caution here if you're using UBL, make sure you're using G code in your slicer that's specific to UBL. So um, in order to prevent that from today's little demo here, we're just going to set bilinear instead. But the other one is this one below it, auto bed level in UDL. So then the next one is here. We want to restore leveling after G28. So G28 is our home. Normally, when you run a home command, it will essentially change the leveling state. We want to re restore the leveling state every time we home. Um, we do want to preheat before leveling. That will increase the um, reliability of the mesh we generate. Um, so then uh, uh, we're going to turn on mesh validation so that we can run the G26 command if we want to. And then since we're using bilinear, we can come down here and we can either use a 3x3, three 4x4, three, four four, or 5x5 five five grid. We could go more. It's kind of pointless. I like 5x5. Five five. It's fast enough that it's not a super big pain. Um, but 
it's still not overwhelmingly overkill. If you want a more specific mesh, that is a very good use case for UBL, in which case you should look up a guide on how to set things up for U UBL. Uh, okay, so then uh, Z. So this one is ultra important if you're using the BL Touch and you are homing using the BL Touch, turn on Z safe homing. Um, that is all good. So now that should be the changes we need for that. So we are going to save those. We're going to switch back to VS Code. Um, and then we are going to open up Marlin, auto build Marlin. We're going to hit clean. Then we're going to hit build one more time. And then, assuming I didn't break anything egregiously while editing, we <laughs> should have, uh, we, we will have produced firmware that has our custom logo on the boot screen. It has uh, a custom name. It supports printing in nylon. Um, we've got a bunch of features around the leveling and the PID tuning and add some fancy little menus to the, uh, to the LCD menu. So let me switch this over for a second. How are we doing? How, how, how many times have you done this? What? <laughs> how many times have you built Marlin? Um, so I don't know a lot, but I, so to give you an idea of the lower bound the other day, so I, I am doing this right now on a brand new account. So I created it, uh, specifically for the stream so that there'd be less clutter around and less chance for like leaking my name or something. Yeah. And a side effect of creating the new account was I was like looking through some of the clutter and just on this machine, just times I've actually saved the firmware. I had, I think about 40 different people's builds that I had done. <laughs> so I, if I had to guess, I've probably built unique Marlin configurations over a hundred times. It shows though. You definitely know what you're doing. Like, yeah. Your explanation has been really, really well. Thank you. I, uh, I'm glad that I can impart some of the, the suffering that Marlon has brought me in a helpful way, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, it, the, the, the part where uh, you're, you were triangulating the BL Touch uh, probe offset, that is, how did you figure that out the first time? <laughs> um, so I don't know. I, I actually don't think I read about it anywhere. I, I think when I was doing the the technique that I saw someone else use was the like draw the the two lines. But when you're communicating over text, so you know, until quite recently in the grand scheme of things, all the people I was talking to in Goncat, it's over text, right? Like you're not yeah. over voice. Over voice, you know, the two lines, two dots thing is fine. But when you're trying to sort of in text tell them which lines you need them to measure, um, it's pretty hard. And I found a lot of people, I, I was either bad explaining or it's just kind of confusing as it is. And they were measuring the sort of hypotenuse there. And so I found that the drawing the triangle technique was useful both from the perspective of like doing it as a good visual aid for what we are measuring. And also it makes it a lot harder to... Uh, not follow correctly if you're following along from text. For sure, for sure. Yeah, no, that, that was crazy. Yeah, I've never even heard of that. <laughs> so that, that, that was cool. Yeah. yeah. So let me switch back. Wait, I need to minimize StreamYard again so we don't get the infinite regress. Okay, so we've got our uh, stuff built successfully. So I think... I think we should probably call it there. So if you don't have a, excuse me, you don't have a uh, printer with a BL touch and Ender 3 and uh, Creality V2 board right now, is that correct? Wait, say that again. 
Um, so right now you do have a Ender Three Pro with a Creality board, but it does yeah. not have to be all touch, right? It d it does not. So we can try flashing it. It's just not going to function correctly because it can't home. Um, is that something you want to do, or do we want to uh, wait? Yeah, the, no, I, I can try it. Okay, so then I'm going to open up... Uh, Element has just been completely broken for me the past week. So I'm just going to send it to you in Discord. Uh, that works. Uh, so I'm going to copy this over from my... Where am I? Okay. I'm formatting the SD card real quick. So I have sent that over to you. Um, while you are formatting that SD card. One thing that I want to shout out briefly, because, you know, it's not every day you get to talk about firmware at length on stream, um, is, let me search for it. So many, many moons ago, I was working on, uh, well, a very nice gentleman who you may have heard of by the name of Invader Zip wanted to make a uh, custom boot screen for an Ender 3 V2, which, you know, they have the much fancier uh, color screens instead of the sort of super stripped down two color LCDs. Yeah. And, um, this was before I was part of Are We Cool Yet? And you know, essentially, I got into Are We Cool Yet because I helped Invader Zip out by building out all these tools for building your own uh, Ender 3 V2 screen firmware. And so um, the screen firmware and uh, board firmware need to uh, chat correctly. But... Uh, this guide, I spent quite a bit of time trying to clean it up and make it clear what all these things do. And the program itself is like quite, uh, I don't know that it's super polished, but like, you know, it's That's actually, polished. no, yeah, it's pretty polished. <laughs> so, um, if you are on Mac OS, it will work super well. And if you are on Linux, it will work super well. I've never successfully run it on windows, but <laughs> You know, you uh, your mileage may vary, and it is kind of a, a cool project if you have an Ender 3 V2 and you want to tinker. No promises on uh, anything oh, working out how you expect. So if it is giving you broken stuff for some reason, let me know, and I'll see if I can help you out. And also uh, make sure that you know... Um, where to find other default screen firmware like a gyres marlin has a bunch gyres marlin so i think his name is jacob myers uh he has done a huge amount of work on making super super nice firmware for the ender 3 v2 based on marlin um, so if you go in here and go to display firmware, if you like somehow bricked your display because you were using Cape's shitty screen firmware customizer, <laughs> uh, you can just fix it with this. But if some of you guys do customize your display firmware, let me know. I, I would love to see more people use it because as far as I know, uh, only myself and maybe two or three other people have ever used this tool. Um, <laughs> You can actually check the insights. Uh, have, that's something I've done for, for the first time uh, recently on uh, GitHub and actually see how many people are viewing your code. It's kind of okay. a trip. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's actually kind of a trip. It, it definitely it definitely works, by the way. Uh, the, the boot screen works. Can, can you point the camera at the, the boot screen and reboot it so I can see? Totally. Yeah. 
Who said? Yeah. There it is. There you go. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that worked out well. Oh. Oh wait, Danny. I so I was about to say oh, we should probably look at the comments before uh, wrapping up, but I saw Danny roasting me about not putting down my hair. So <laughs> I've done it now. We can say that there still is no stream where Cave didn't let down his hair at some point. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna scroll through here super quick and see if there's anything uh, super pressing question wise. Um, is that Cape or Fabio doing a stand-in? It's it's Cape. <laughs> Fabio does not know this much about D Win screen firmware. Okay. Um, the <laughs> oh god, that's so funny. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't see any like super uh, specific comments uh, there are a lot but i i don't see any that are like about uh anything super pressing so i think that's it from my end is there anything you want to chat about before we wrap up for the day oh uh <laughs> yeah, uh you will kill me if i don't bring it up um we're we're releasing uh the drip drip pack um it's coming up i can't remember the exact day i'll have to get back to you on that but it's coming out soon, and there's a lot of grips in there. Hell a yeah, lot. yeah, dude. I. So, what is your your dev process like right now? Are are you just cranking these out in a single sitting? Are you revisiting? Are you? <laughs> um. So for me, most of the time it's through like all the way through one sitting. Yeah. Okay. And I'll usually like start with like a picture or someone will send me a picture and then i'll just go based off of just that picture alone try to re replicate it okay it's kind of cool many enemies actually sends me them all the time like all the time he's, he's got some good ones <laughs> yeah <laughs> the, tell many i said hi i feel like i haven't talked to many in a little while it's sad i i miss my boy many dude yeah yeah no uh, can you people. hear my my cat is going <laughs> <laughs> time to eat or what it's time to eat apparently <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. well definitely check that out uh is it releasing sometime this week uh i want to say the 90th or something is the day everything had to be together so like around then okay probably, probably so probably. sometime the next two weeks definitely check out uh that release it will include Tons of the very, very cool work Durbin has been doing in the drip room. He is immensely talented at what he does. And if you have seen any of many enemies uh, builds or Durbin's builds floating around on Instagram featuring super crazy and cool furniture stuff, that's <laughs> probably because Durbin is a talented dev. Go print <laughs> some stuff. You can print it in every state printed in australia they don't care you're allowed yeah. to have ar grips anywhere man so yeah. check that out and uh that is it for today we are signing off we love you guys and we hope that you have a wonderful week and good luck with all your changes to your firmware peace <laughs>